um, find somewhere to go to church, and, and if someone knew I was in the area, would invite me in to speak, and I would accept. And um, so I can't really think of any time, really, this is the first time in my life to go more than uh, three weeks without without preaching. So I'm very excited to be here this morning. I hope uh, hope you've got some time. I'm not going to take too much time, but um, because what I have to share, I think it's going to take a little while to spill out. But uh, I do want to, at this time, thank our church families, uh, all of you, for really just accepting and permitting and releasing uh, Dale and I to go on this sabbatical. Um, it was uh, just a truly rewarding time for us uh, as a couple in, in, mar in our marriage uh, to connect with our family um, that um, down south where we, where we came from. Uh, so I really want to thank you as a church for that. I want to thank the ministry teams this morning, our care team especially, who I know has been reaching out in prayer and following up on so many of you who maybe had a health need or, or maybe something else was required and and uh, they called and they, they, they made you aware that you were being cared for and looked after. I do want to thank our care team for that. And I want to thank our officers and trustees. It was over two years ago um, that I met with you and after going on the Sunscape Retreat up in the Adirondacks and learned really for the first time about sabbatical and about Sabbath keeping, um, you put a policy in place that permitted me to have this experience um, and not only for me, but we put a policy in place that in the future for those who, even after I'm gone, will, will be the pastor of this church, will know that they can anticipate a season of refreshment periodically in their life of ministry as well. And I think that's very forward-looking, forward-thinking. And I want to thank trustees for that as well, for myself and for the future of the church. So, amen. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. I thank you, God, for the shepherd's song. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, leads me beside still waters, restores my soul. Lord, I thank you, God, for restoration. I thank you for healing and rebuilding our lives that oftentimes just get worn down with use. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in our church and our church family and all the families that are gathered here today and are watching by phone or by their home computer today. I know, God, you're working. And we know, God, that the church is held together by your word and by your spirit and certainly by the voice of Christ who said, I will build my church. What you build, Lord, you sustain. What you establish, you uphold. What you have spoken, Lord, is enduring. And we thank you, God, today for the eternal church that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. That word, he leads me beside still waters, was the word the Lord spoke to me the first day I was away. And, uh, and, and let me explain Sabbath this way. I'm going to get into my message in just a moment. I just feel like I need to give a couple words of introduction about, about Sabbath. In the creation, when God made creation, and we read those chapters in Genesis, and I know we, you know, people, you know, just, we get caught up in the science of it and all this sort of thing, and I really think it, there's certainly a point to be made there, but I think it's almost, in some part, we can miss the real point of what creation was. Creation was God building a temple for himself and for man to dwell with him. And when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. That's not just something future. That is the will and the purpose of God is for heaven and for earth to be joined together. And God then in that creation carved out a garden with four rivers and he, he dedicated a space and that's where he put the man. And then we find the image of the temple from Exodus into the books of Samuel, Kings, right on through our Old Testament and even into the New Testament with one little caveat. That all of a sudden, Jesus said to a man or to a woman, your sins are forgiven. 
And when Jesus said that, it caught the ear of the Pharisees and Sadducees because they're thinking, wait a minute, there's only one place sins can be forgiven, and that's in the temple. And what Jesus did was relocated the temple from place to person. And they, they marveled. How is it he forgives sins? Because God ultimately in everything he does is to reveal to us the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now to follow that with Sabbath, God then carved out one day. Adam after he had been created, the first day he was in creation. His first day was a day of rest. He, man was created on the sixth day. The seventh day God said he rested and, and man rested. First day was rest. And Sabbath is something that we can also find throughout. And of course, Jesus then says, Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, you'll find rest for your souls. I'll give you rest. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. And once again, Jesus takes the Sabbath and locates it from a time to person. From time to person. And every time that we observe Sabbath or observe rest, we too are experiencing the future creation, the future new creation that God has established and bringing it into our time and saying, yes, Lord. And God is saying, yes to man. This is for you. The Sabbath is for you. God didn't make man for the Sabbath. He made the Sabbath for man. And so that's a beautiful thing that we would observe that God carves out space and he carves out time and puts man in the midst of it and says, now experience me and wonder in the glory of who I am. Ministry. As I said, you know, the Lord said to me the first day of my, of my Sabbath, sabbatical, um, I found myself saying over and over, he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. The thing about still waters, <laughs> when waters aren't moving, is you get to re a reflection, not only of the creation that's around, you know, the sky all of a sudden becomes reflected and mirrored in the water, but if, if you look into the water of yourself, you get a reflection of you. <laughs> and what the, the Lord had kind of showed me was that you know, it, it wasn't the, the years. It's not the years. It's the movement that ministry requires. It's the movement. It's the motion that becomes where you need to find time for rest. Can you say amen to that? I mean, it's, it, it, we get very busy, and we can begin to think that being busy is how we justify our existence or how we justify our purpose, or we give meaning to our life by being busy. We don't even know what to do if someone tells us they have time. We, we immediately think, well, they must be maybe lazy, we might think. Or, and I, I know myself, I believe the lie that to need rest was a sign of weakness, so you never, you know, you never said, I need rest. So that was just a, you know, heavy, get over the pride of that, and, and confess that rest is important as motion. But anyway, I thought a lot about the water, and Neil and I, for these past six weeks, really were along the Outer Banks of North Carolina, which is an island, as you know, and surrounded by water, sound on one side, ocean on the other. And um, that's where my entire sabbatical was spent. Um, pretty much in seclusion. If I visited anybody, it was outside on the beach or at a picnic table, you know, uh, somewhere we could observe all these social distancing things that we've been asked by the various states to, and governments to observe. But as I sat by the water, whether it was the moving water of the mighty Atlantic Ocean or whether it was the still waters of the pond where the house we were at is nestled in, I, I started thinking about humanity. I started thinking about all the unrest in the world because we left at a time when, as you know, there's been a lot of civil unrest and a lot of things happening within our culture that have been moving very, very fast and taking place. And I thought of the word in Revelation where the, the, the humanity is described as a sea. 
humanity is described as a seed. In Revelation 12, 12, it says that the, you know, the devil comes down to the sea having great wrath. In other words, the devil is adversarial. And we've seen a lot of adversity and adversarial circumstances in our lives, adversarial circumstances um, in our, our culture right now, in society. There's been a lot of advers ad ad adversity. Um, and I do believe that God wants to speak something into that. Uh, I do believe that there's a response that our church has to respond with into that. I'm so grateful that our leadership team got together and gave the response that was made public of prayer and concern and validating both the concerns of those who have been marginalized and have felt um, that they have been, and have not felt, but have been oppressed, um, that there is a, a time of reckoning um, for that. Um, but water in the Bible, again, sea of humanity, the devil coming into it, creating unrest, adversity. Water in Scripture is also a symbol of power, of God's power. Psalm 93 and verse 4 says, More than the sounds of many waters, than the mighty breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. In other words, it doesn't matter how loudly or how forcefully things opposed humanity are, God is still greater. Doesn't matter how large the building waves get, how high the breakers get, how threatening the waters, God is still greater and mightier. That's what Psalm 8, 93 and 4 is saying, the Lord on high is mighty. A similar thought is found also in Isaiah 17 and verse 3, where it says, The nations rumble on like the rumbling of many waters, but he will rebuke them and they will flee far away. So God isn't intimidated by the roar of opposition. God gets into the breakers, God gets into the fray, God gets into the fight, God combats adversity. With the voice of his own mouth, the voice of his word. So the sound of many waters in the Bible isn't always the noise of the enemy roaring at us. Listen to Ezekiel chapter 43 and verse 2. It says, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the way of the east, and his voice, God's voice, listen, was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. I love the water. I've always loved the water. One of the things that so drew Dale and I when, when God called us here was visiting Hammonasset, you know, uh, beach and seeing the water there. But I would have to tell you that the Long Island Sound is just a little bit smaller than the mighty Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> and I grew up in the beaches of Virginia Beach, Virginia, where when the waves got big, we went surfing. And I'm happy to tell you that I got some big waves when I was down in the Outer Banks and connected with some old friends, some serpent pals, and were able to uh, get out into those breakers once again and speak so loud that you could not even hear each other talk. Um, but the power of a wave, the power of moving water, the sound of moving water is incredible. I mean, it's overwhelming. Maybe you haven't had that experience. Maybe you sat under a waterfall. You, you just couldn't resist when the water was falling up. Maybe Kent Falls in, in New Milford, Connecticut. Or maybe someplace else. You just stood under the, the water. You just let it just pour on your back or on the back of your neck. And you just let it rest there. God, God says, as he just says God, God's voice is like the sound of many waters. In other words, it's forceful. There's a, there's a pressure behind it. imagery of water that Ezekiel saw represents the glory of God. The sound of moving water, as I said, can be deafening. But it's not a threatening or intimidating sound. It's a glorious sound. It's God himself who's roaring like the mighty waters. The first time Ezekiel had a vision of God, he was by the river Kebar in Babylon. But now, in this vision, Ezekiel 42, he's not by the river, but he's by the temple, and he sees the water of God coming out of the temple. 
And that's the sound of the water which he heard. And it was the sound and the glory of the voice of God coming out of the temple that he found to be so, so deafening, so revealing, so illuminating. And now in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 15, his feet, speaking of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, risen Lord, his feet were like burnished bronze. When it has made to glow a furnace, and his voice is like the sound of many waters. His voice. Now think about this. Who's speaking? Just as John who had his head lying on the breast of Jesus in the upper room at the Last Supper. This is the voice that John knew whom Jesus had called friend. This is the voice of one whom he had heard on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is the voice of the one whom he had heard preach the Sermon on the Mount. But it sounds different now. He did not just describe it as the voice of a friend, he describes his voice as the voice of many waters. He's encountering Jesus risen, ascended to glory. And his voice was not that familiar voice of the one who said from the cross, John, behold your mother. And he was given that charge to take care of Mary the rest of her life. But it was the sound of the voice of many waters. A voice that that is persuasive, a voice that is power, a voice that is forceful. This is the symbol of the greatness and the glory of the God who has taken us under his wing of protection. He has a voice of many waters. So, if you've ever felt the force of water, been caught in a riptide, or tried to stand in the midst of the ocean when a northeast wind is blowing and there are five and six foot breakers and you can't get yourself through the white water or even get a breath. You know how exhausting and how tiring that can be. And you can become very overwhelmed very quickly. And I'll tell you this, the enemy is seeking to get into our society and to create disruption. He's cre creating adversarial things, but God is in the midst of the sea that is humanity, and his voice is also as a voice of many waters. And God has something to say in the midst of this crisis, both the pandemic and the societal crisis that we find ourselves in. And I believe that. And those who have ears to hear will hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church and through the church because we are the temple of God from which the river of God is now moving through. That is the voice of many waters and we have to respond. Can you say that? Amen. We have to respond. So let's talk about the voice of God this week, next week. And tell you that, first of all, I hope that the voice of the Lord is the most forceful and influential voice in your life right now. That's my prayer for you. As your pastor, as a friend, as a colleague, I pray that the voice of God is the most influential and forceful voice in your life. It's capable of moving you, but you have to recognize the power of that voice. Like the voice of many waters. The voice of God is not a voice of entertainment. God doesn't speak for entertainment purposes. I know, I've heard voices of entertainers, and you have too. We like comedians. We all like comedians. Entertainers. In fact, I think it was um, Charles Hayden Spurgeon who said, I fear the day will soon come when instead of having pastors shepherding sheep, we'll have entertainers speaking to goats. I pray that day, we never see that day. But God has called the church to have a voice. Abraham was such a man early on in the Bible that heard the voice of God. The voice of God called him out of Ur, modern Babylon today, out of the land of the Chaldees where he would now go and father a nation. The word came to him. It was forceful enough that Abraham packed up his family, packed up his father, took Lot, his nephew with him, and they journeyed, not knowing where they were going to go. They were just going to be heading west, across the Euphrates, over 1,200 miles of sand and wilderness, 
into the land that we now know. He would experience hearing God's promise to him at a promise of a son. That God would father through him a nation and give him a son even in his old age. And then God would make a covenant with Abraham that would extend to all of humanity. Descendants, God said, will be as numerous as the stars of the heavens. In other words, you're going to have spiritual sons and daughters, the heavens, and sands of the seashore. You're going to have natural sons and daughters as well. It was a persuasive voice. And though his life, throughout his life, Abraham would experience the powerful, persuasive voice of God coming to him in many different ways. And so God can speak to us, how many know, as forcefully as the voice of many waters, and he can also speak to us beside the still waters and restore our soul. Have you known the voice of God to speak to you like the breakers of the sea, forcefully, persuasively, but also known the voice of God to speak to you like the quiet, still pools? The pond where I was you know, what we were saying must have had a hundred turtles in it. Turtles the size of dinner plates. Do you know how slow life has to get to where your daily entertainment is watching turtles? <laughs> Things have to really slow down quite a bit. Dale, come quickly. Oh, well, never mind. Take your time. It's not going to happen fast. <laughs> This is how God speaks to us. That's kind of the paradox of living the Christian life, isn't it? That hearing God speak in forceful, powerful, moving ways that uproot a man out of a country, and then hearing God speak in ways that bring comfort and restoration to soul and life, like the still pools where there can be reflection and communion. Turn to Genesis chapter 22, and let's read verses 1 to 14. It came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac, his son, he stood wood for the burnt offering, arose and went to the place in which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. And Abraham said to his young man, Stay here with the donkey. I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. We all know the story very well, and it's another time when God spoke to Abraham. And I would say it was... A persuasive, the persuasive voice of God. A voice that maybe came across forceful because this is a voice of tests. We can all remember back in our high school days or elementary school days when the teacher announced a test. Her voice changed. All right, put your books away. It's time for a test. No warning. And we would quickly ask, is the open book test? <laughs> Can we use our notes? We would panic about the tests. Well, God says, after these things, God tested Abraham. This is not a test. When you were in school, the test was about information. How much did you learn? Did you read the previous chapters? Did you study the appropriate material? This is not a test where God's trying to simply acquire information. This is a test for Abraham about whether or not he has learned what kind of God God is. What kind of God are you? This is a test of relationship. This is a test of communion. This is a test about abiding. Staying with. Abraham, we know, would be later called the friend of God. But this was not a test. Like in school, where you're tested midterms to see if you can advance to other material, or tested at the end of the year to see if you can go on to the next grade. This is a, not a test to determine promotion for Abraham. As I said, it's a test about relationship. I say it's not a test about promotion because 
God has already promoted Abraham. You say, when did God promote him? In Genesis chapter 17. When God said, Abraham, I'm changing your name from Abram to Abraham, father of many nations. That's promotion. And this is before Abraham had done anything, before he had been tested in this test. How many of that is the goodness of our God? That, that's what grace is. God giving us what we don't deserve. God promoting us before we got approved. Because God, we already stand in God's approval and acceptance and love and endearment. That's what grace is. Unmerited favor. God so loved the world, he gave. Do you recognize who the giver is? So when God calls Abraham, hear this now. Abraham responds. God says, Abraham. And Abraham says, what does he say? Here I am. Let's all say it together out loud. Wherever we are, online, here, Living Rock Church. Ready? One, two, three. Here I am. Now this is a very interesting response. Here I am. Because in Hebrew, when it's stretched out and elongated, the understanding of here I am is... I'm ready to do whatever you ask, even though I don't know the details yet. See, when God says to Abraham, Abraham had faith. It's Abraham believing God, even though God has not revealed the plan. How many that's what faith is? Faith is saying yes to God, saying yes, I'm ready to do whatever you want me to do, whatever you ask, even though I don't consent to the plan, I, I don't know what the plan is, I don't have the details, I don't get to review them ahead of time and, and edit them according to my desires. I'm listening, Lord. 
with the intention of doing whatever it is you want, can you and I obey God that way? Without knowing the details? Because we like to know stuff. We like to know stuff. This is what's made Facebook a giant in our culture today, social media, because we like to know stuff. And we like to know stuff, not only about stuff, we like to know stuff about other people too. Can we obey God? Faith is trusting and knowing the person with whom you're speaking with, not the details. Faith is trusting and knowing the person with whom you're speaking, not in the details. Faith is the substance of something hoped for, the evidence unseen that our Hebrew says. And too many times we want the evidence that something's going to work out before we join in, sign up. I want to know this is going to work. I want to know how this turns out. I want to know what you're doing, why you're doing what you're doing. Then came the question, the request of God to Abraham. Sacrifice your son. Your only son. I pause there deliberately. Because Abraham has two sons. He has a son named Ishmael. And this son was the result of a carefully contrived plan. <laughs> a plan. To try to fulfill what God was saying about having a child in old age. Well, you know, we've got this law here, this custom that says, you know, you go into your, your handmaiden, and, and Sarah gave her handmaiden to, Mo, to Abraham, and, and they had this child, Ishmael. But God was not interested in the child that had been produced or manufactured. God was inter inter interested in the child that had been promised. How many of there is a difference between the produced and the promised? So God is specific. Take your son, your only son. I'm talking about the one that you love. Because when God asks for something, sometimes we reach for that which we can do without. Not to, to be cruel here, but Abraham and Sarah, I mean, really loved Isaac. This was the promised child that came in their old age. And I'm sure they loved Ishmael, but later on, he became a little bit of a problem. And they had to send him away along with his mother. And there they went. Off in the wilderness. This is our dilemma. You see, if you produce something, you've got to keep it together. What you produce, you've got to keep going. What you produce, you've got to keep looking after, tending, watching over, making plans. How are you going to keep it safe? How are you going to watch? What you produce, you've got to tend. But what God promises, he takes care of. What God promises, he takes responsibility for. This is what faith is. Think about the church. When it comes to the church, God says, I'll build it. I'll build it. And if so, God builds it, he'll keep it together. If God builds it, come virus, come unrest, come hardship, it'll be sustained. And it has been sustained for over 2,000 years. Because God holds it. It's the eternal church. Sustained. By the fact that God said, in his word, the voice of many waters, I, I will build my church. Isaac was promised by God. He was the son through whom all the earth will be blessed. There's just one, and there's only one church, not many. We may meet in different places. We may meet under different names and brands. But I mean, oh, God knows there's only one church. I remember for many years early in the ministry, I was on some kind of quest to have the perfect church. There's just no such thing. And I don't mean perfect with people perfect. I mean perfect in every aspect of, 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 of tradition and, 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 and systems and, 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 and doctrines. 
to me because people are still fighting today over whether, you know, over the uh, superlapsarianism and infralapsarianism. You can look that up if you want. Still fighting about those two things. Or Calvinism and Arminianism. Still fighting about those things today. Theologians. So I, I, I have a little different view today about the church. My view is there's just one. And thank God I'm a part of it. But it is a church that's meeting in prayer. God knows who's his people are. He knows where the wheat is. And he tells us, be very careful. The evil will start plucking out on your own. Because he's going to do that. And angels, he'll, he'll be able to know the difference. He'll do the harvesting when that time comes. We're not going to do that now. In fact, the church, I think, is a lot like that seven-branched candlestick that I have in my office. A menorah. Seven branches. All connected to one, one stem. One base. And I think there are different traditions. And I'm coming later in life to just appreciate the various traditions and liturgies. Because when it comes to liturgy, it's not a question of is it boring, that's boring, or does it give life? The question is, is it true? I don't mind saying something if it's true. No matter who wrote it or when it was written, he'd say amen. If it's true, I'm going to say it. The Apostles' Creed is true. I say it every day. Because I recognize the faith that I'm giving to you is a received faith. It's as old. 2,000 years old. And I received that faith. That now I'm delivering them to you. And the same for you. We don't get to just invent what we want to believe. We don't get to just create out of thin air. Well, this is what it is. This, I must be this then. I don't know. Maybe we should ask more questions, sit more quietly, ask the Holy Spirit to direct us more intently. Learn more about the ways of God. So God says to Abraham, the one you, I promised you, the promised child, that you're, your only son, God knows who the only son is. Do you know who the only son is? Do you know there's only one church? Do you know what that only church is? How to recognize it. How to recognize that only church. That one. There's a big difference between the manufactured, or the produced, and the promised. Just as much as there's a big difference between the temporal and the eternal. Because one's fading away and one is going on into eternity. The temporal and manufactured has got to be managed. The eternal just has to be believed and received. That's the difference. There are things in our lives, church, that we have produced in our own determination, in our own desire to fulfill some whatever we worked hard on, we produced it, we had a great plan, it was a great scheme, it worked. God says, I'm not interested in what you worked at. I'm interested in what I gave you. And what I gave you, I want. What I gave you, I want. It's not yours to control. Here I am, ready to do what you want, Lord, without knowing the details. And then God said, take your son, your only son. <sighs> Not the one you can do without Abraham, the one you love. The test comes when you have to give what you love. And some of us are loving the things that God has given us and holding on to tightly, and that is the test. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. Can we be led by the voice of God and the faith of God in such a way that the Lord will actually redirect our loves? What kind of God is asking Abraham? 
or better, let's ask the question this way. What God is asking Abraham to do something that pagans do? I mean, I don't know, you know, early on as a Christian young man, this text used to bother me. I, I thought of all kinds of ways of going around it. Well, surely God not asking Abraham to kill his son. I mean, there was at one time, years ago in Long Island, a woman who actually did take the life of her child. And again, using scripture like this to, to justify. Or another woman I read about one time who took the life of her two children, so much worried that they were going to go to hell, she figured better to kill them now while they're young so that they won't have to be worried about going to hell because all babies go to heaven and she took the life drowning in the bathtub. This is crazy. This is lunacy. But it's what bothered me. God, what are you, what are you asking? Why, why are you asking him to do something that that's what the pagans do? That when they worship Molech and Asheroth and, and the moon god. Offering children as a sacrifice is something the pagans do to appease an angry deity. When, 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 when the crops aren't harvesting, we've got to sacrifice something so the God will shine favors and send the rain so we can have our, our, our harvest. We've got to appease this angry God. Is God like that? Are you like other gods? Is that what you want, to be appeased? See, without a revelation of who God, if I said this is a test about relationship, it's about communion, it's about abiding, is because without a revelation of God from God, we're all going to create a God in our own making. We will invent one of our own image, and he'll be like us. So if we're a resentful person and bitter, we can, we can create an angry, bitter, resentful God. And then we think that he has to behave that way because that's how we, we understand it. If we're selfishly controlling, we make God that way. In your Bible, here it is. I can't take it out of the Bible. It's in there. God's asking Abraham to do something that we look back on and we say, well, God would really never ask somebody to do that. But I can't say that. That's what I said in my youth. What would God really, he never really asked him. But, but, but the, that, that's not what it says. It says he really did ask him. And this story continues right up until the moment when Abraham has a dagger over his naked son's chest about ready to plunge that knife through that cavity. When God calls out again, it says, Abraham, this time twice. Abraham calls out to him twice. Don't touch him. Don't harm the child. Don't harm the child. Let me just stop here for a second, and then I want to close. Even though the instructions don't sound like God, would you be able to listen still, recognizing that it was his voice? Can I say that again? Even if the instructions don't sound like God, can you continue to listen and recognize that it indeed is his voice? Abraham did that. It still sounds. And how many times today, you know, we hear things that that doesn't sound like God. It just doesn't sound like it. But, but I know that's his voice. I, I recognize that that is his voice. How many times do the Pharisees and Sadducees reject the voice of the Lord now in the person of the Lord Jesus? Because now, <laughs> in this beautiful Temple has moved from place to person. Sabbath has moved from time to person. And word moves from paper to person. Isn't that something? The word of God made flesh. The 
Pharisees. Well, Jesus says, he heals on the Sabbath. That, that, that can't, he can't be God. He says, he's a Beelzebub. He's, he's a, the, the, the devil. He cast, only the devil can cast out devils. He must be of the, this, this cannot be. Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard it said. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, who are you to edit Moses? Who are you to cause us to question what was down there in Exodus and Leviticus? Well, hold on a minute. Hold on. They couldn't hear the voice of God because Jesus didn't sound like what they expected. Not to sound like. Be careful when we judge someone saying, God would never ask them to do that. Be careful when we say that. Be careful when you judge somebody, oh, God would never ask you to do that. Why, why are they sticking by them? Why are they standing with them in this moment? Don't they know blah, 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 blah? Do you know what God said to them? Well, why, well, why did... Why did they... Why are they going to that place? God would never ask them. God would never ask me to go to that place. Be careful what you say God will never do. Be careful judging what you say God will never ask someone to do. Because here we've got it right in the black and white in our Bibles. That's Abraham. Sacrifice yourself. That sounds a lot of what pagans do. God, I sure hope you're not like that. Hey, I know you want your promise back, but and Ryan Hebrews gives us some really important information. Now, I, I really need to close. I want me to say this first. It's dangerous to rush quickly to judgment because of impatience. Because we all want this neat, tidy little package. I want to say this down. I hope you write this down in bold letters. Listening to God, especially in the midst of of the times in which we now find ourselves living can be a little messy. Listening to God can get messy. You have to keep listening. And after a while, you start learning God's ways. You know what he means by what he says, not just what he says. You gotta know what God means by what he says, not just what he says. How many went through that childish phase with your kids? I've seen this now with my own grandkids. My daughter will say to our young grandson, Asher, he's moving and she wants to be still, be still. He'll straighten up. Then she'll give him another command. No, go over there and help your brother. You said be still. I'm sticking with the first command. You said it, didn't you? Yeah, I said it. Well, I'm doing what you said. But now I'm saying something else, but I'm doing what you said. And you know, how many times we do this with God? We think we're in obedience because of something God said, and he did say it. But because we stop listening, we're unable to hear the next command, which is moving us from our position of what he said to what he's saying. It's relationship that brings you into a place where you can hear what God's saying and not just what he said. I can quote Betty Crocker without ever knowing what's in Betty, Cro uh, what's in Betty Crocker's cookbook without ever knowing Betty Crocker. I can quote Julia Childs, what she's got written in her recipe books without ever knowing Julia Childs. But I can't walk with God and keep his word without abiding in a communion relationship with him, lest, hear this now, I'm going to pick this up next week with you, lest Abraham kill the promise that God in reality wants to live because Abraham is continuing to listen. Uh, Abraham, that, kill, uh, uh, that expired, I'm now saying this, don't harm the child. Now I know that you love me. I know this is about our relationship now. I know this is about you abiding in me. It's about you continuing to listen. It's not about you just taking something I said and running off in your own direction with it. It's about relationship that you keep listening. 
You keep hearing what I'm saying. And thank you, Jesus, that when he ascended on high, he sent the Holy Ghost. He said, I'm not just going to leave you with a book. I'm going to leave you with a guide to help you with the book. I'm going to leave you with a guide to help reveal you everything that I've said so that you'll understand it. You'll know how to apply it. You'll know what to do with it. I'll lead you into all the truth. Once Abraham gets near the mountain, he turns to his companions, young men that had traveled with him, donkey. So you guys stay here. I and the child are going up to worship. And we will come back. And I asked the Lord, God, well, why did why did those why did Abraham tell them to stay there? He said this, some separations are necessary for me to take you where I want to take you. Some of us are still whining and crying about relationships that are no more in our life. But God is saying, listen, where I'm taking you, they may have talked you out of it. What I'm asking you to do, they may have, if they were still journeying with you, would have said, you know what? <laughs> no, no, we, we, we ain't be a part of this. No, sir. Oh, no, no, no. I ain't carrying down some dead child. <laughs> the writer of Hebrews gives us some insight. It says that Abraham believed that even if he had killed his son, that God would have raised him back to life. How I many know God is attracted to that kind of faith? He's, attra he's attracted to a man that says, God, can you do this? I mean, I've never seen a resurrection before. I don't think Abraham ever did. I think that's probably something he never had more witness to. But, but the Bible tells us that he kind of had an inkling that maybe, just maybe this God that called him out of earth could do things that no other God he ever experienced could do. Maybe raises from the dead. Yeah, I am the lad. After we go and worship, we're coming back. But for right now, you stay here. Stop crying about people that are no longer in your life. Those separations may have been very necessary, a part part of where God is bringing you to a place of testing. And they weren't going to be good for you on the mountain. Because by the way, on the mountain, Abraham got a revelation. After God said, don't harm the child, he looked, and there was a ram caught in the thicket. And God didn't tell Abraham, not go off of that instead. Abraham knew what kind of God he is. He doesn't want to take the life of a child. He wants a substitution. This is the God who said he will, he will provide himself a sacrifice. This is a God who doesn't need to be appeased who's some angry deity. He's a God who loves us so much he offers us a substitute. So man will not die, but man will live. Can you say that? This is such good news for us. And this is the voice of many waters that God wants going out of the temple today forcefully to bring reconciliation and healing and life and a bridge to a better tomorrow. I just happen to believe that while we're here, we ought to be working kingdom work. Amen. That whatever, Lord, you, your kingdom come, you will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, this Sabbath thing, we're going we're gonna to practice rest. Amen. We're going to be different. We're not going to work seven days a week. We're going to practice today. Why? We're going to bring it into the now. What we know is the future. But you're gonna, it's, it's now for us. It's now. Amen. Well, I've got more to say, but we don't have the time to say it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for your provision in our life. Thank you for your gifts. Thank you for your blessings in our life. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. Voice where we see the sea of humanity turbulent, billowing waves. We see a lot of arguing, a lot of things, Lord, that are frothing and foaming. And the end, we're taking advantage of 
people who are lost. Prejudices that go back thousands of years, even. Biases, injustices, way humanity has cheated humanity, all been stirred and coaxed into it by the adversary, of course. But Lord, we pray, God, for your eternal church, the one with whom, Lord, you reign as king, the one with whom, Lord, you are the foundation stone, the one with whom is the temple, the one with whom you are speaking through the voice of many waters to hold back the raging, foaming tide and to turn it around, Lord, in this hour. Let thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Through us, Lord, in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, with our heads bowed, where we are on this property here, I don't know if we're still, still alive, so we're still alive on live. Let's just take a moment. Is, is there something? Is, is God calling you to a, to step up into a higher place? Maybe you've been resisting it, you've been contemplating it at the foot of the mountain. You've, you've not been ready to ascend with the Lord just yet. You've not been ready to go up to that place. Would you just confess, Lord, I... I I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, here I am. I'm going to say, Lord, do with me what you want. I'm going to say, Lord, you know, I don't need to know all the details. I don't need to have you roll your plan out in front of me and sign on with consent. I trust you. I trust who you are. I trust whom you have revealed yourself to be. I trust that you are kind, long-suffering, generous, that you're full of goodness and love, that you are light and life, I trust, Lord, that those who trust you, God, that you have good things planned for them. That the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. I trust you, God, that the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn. It shines brighter and brighter into the full day. I trust, God, that you are the God of resurrection, that whatever is, I, is surrendered and given over to you, God, you can multiply and press down and press it down and shake it together and multiply it even a hundredfold back that I cannot outgive you, that you are the great giver and sustainer in the land of the living. So with one careful step in front of the other, I begin my sin. Up with the Lord. Up to a place of higher communion, higher abiding, a higher knowing, a, a greater revelation that the Lord is our provider was the revelation that Abraham came down from that mountain that the Lord provides. God, let us see you in a new, new way through Jesus, Lord, in our generation. Let all false images, let all false gods, let all false things, Lord, that have been propped up by systems and traditions for so long, for centuries, God, be torn down while we're out of our churches and out of our buildings and standing in the very garden that you made, Lord, a sacred space, Lord, for man and God to, to come together in communion and worship God. Let us see you anew. Let us see you afresh. Let us know you, who you are. We call out to those, Lord, who yet experience you. May they experience you, Lord, through the church, through who we are. As your witnesses, witnesses of life, witnesses of your spirit and goodness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, may God bless you. And uh, if you like prayer, and I'm happy to stay here and pray for a little while. Just come up and stand if you're here today. If you want to come up and just stand, I'll, I'll come to you. I'll put a mask on and, and, uh, and minister as the Lord leads if you think you like prayer today. If not, that's fine. It's great to see everybody. You're welcome to stay around and visit a little bit. Come back tonight, uh, you know, for, for praise and for, and for worship. The care team that is here that also wants to help you with the prayer, I would love to have you participate in that prayer, prayer time as well. Um, it's good to be home. I want to thank you again for the rest, for the sabbatical, and um, we're just truly grateful. And God bless you. Let's have a great day in the Lord together. Bye-bye.